Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Tuesday, October 26th, 2021. Once again, it's my great pleasure to be back with Professor John E. Burka. John, always great to be with you. Great, great to be with you too, David. John, today I'd like to start with a service question. The Solar Energy Re Research Institute, Chemical Sciences Review Panel, 1990 to 1993. Can you tell me a little bit about that work and what was going on in solar energy research at that point? Wow, that was way back. Uh, I remember going there. I was in Golden, Colorado, uh, as I recall. And I was uh, a member of a panel that had about six scientists. I guess I was really the only organometallic chemist. Uh, but at that time, uh, solar energy was not really the forefront in the big agencies, and so they had their own. Um, I'm trying to think why it was I was involved. <laughs> I think they just wanted a chemist, and I was uh, somebody that had served in other roles that uh, they think they thought I might do a good job. But there, as I recall, solar energy was uh, something that was way far away and there at that time and they were trying to change that uh, there were there were colleagues of mine like Nate Lewis who was doing semiconductor uh, work with uh, you know photocells photovoltaics and so forth and trying to understand the fundamentals um, so I since I served on committees with with some of his students I got to hear a little bit about some of that from the students and also from Nate. Uh, but <clears throat> there were also chemists there doing um, other kinds of research, like trying to reduce some carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide and methanol, which is uh, not really solar. It could be solar, I suppose, because they were using electrochemistry. But um, one of my former postdocs was on staff there, and I remember talking to him about his projects involving palladium catalyzed uh, electrochemical reduction of carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide uh, and i was fascinated by that but that was closer to my own work so it was broader than just solar energy research even though that was the title of the institute john i'm curious given given your work with industries that were involved of course in in petroleum and fossil fuels when did companies like Exxon, for example, when did they start to express interest in alternative energy sources, from your perspective? Exxon was, as I recall, was sort of a late comer. Um, they, were, they were very much interested in uh, petrochemicals and polymers and uh, and of course, fuels mainly gasoline. So they were they were interested in those, and I suppose they had some people doing other kinds of energy research. Uh, but I don't ever recall in all my visits to Exxon uh, talking to somebody who was really right in the middle of solar energy. Uh, BP was quite different. They had their own photochemical uh, energy solar energy uh, branch, it wasn't very big. And they, they were also very much uh, centered on petroleum, of course. And Shell, the same way I consulted with them, as I, I think I told you last time. Um, and uh, again, I didn't hear very much about solar energy back in, the, in around 1990. I forgot, how many years was I with, with uh, I guess it was called Siri then. I forgot. I think it's called Enrail, or is it Enrail now? I believe yeah, so. Okay. Um, anyway, yeah, it, it's. I think that's right. It's now it's broader. It's called National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I think is what the acronym stands for. Um, anyway, I, I'm not sure how many years I worked with Siri, but <clears throat> um, I remember some of the people that were on the panel with me. Uh, uh, but I don't remember much about what we did. There, there was a lot of controversy going on between uh, Nate Lewis and some people at 
Siri at the time it was called Siri uh, about the mechanisms for how, how photovoltaics worked and so forth and what the limits and efficiency were theoretical limits and so forth uh, but we we were also not so much doing discussions with scientists but we were talking to the management and uh, giving them some advice on managerial issues and that was sort of like the 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 job I had on the panels for the uh, DOE laboratories that I visited, like Los Alamos and Livermore, especially, also Lawrence Berkeley for a few years, um, <clears throat> where we would sit and talk to the to the manager of the labs, the director of the labs, and his uh, associate directors and so forth, and uh, give them some ideas about what they might, what kinds of issues they might add to their portfolio and, and give them some feedback on the quality of the science and so forth. Uh, sometimes they would criticize them on their decisions, try to get them to do a strategic uh, planning. And I think that the same sort of thing happened at, at Siri. Um, we, we were doing both science assessment, quality assessment, and also uh, talk to, talking to them about their portfolio and uh, their management. You mentioned, of course, so broader than just Say again. You mentioned BP. I'm curious if in 1992, when you had the Sir Edward Franklin Prize Lectureship of the Royal Society, if that if that was from a BP connection. No, that was. I think that prize is solely administered by the. Royal Society of Chemistry in England, and so not with any one company. Um, it's, it's much like a national prize from the American Chemical Society, except the English version of it. Um, in fact, I, I guess I had, had met at some scientific meetings, I had met some BP scientists, but no, that connection was solely um, that, that big award that they eventually got us was, uh, we eventually got from it was uh, at their own initiation. They, they, they contacted us and asked us to prepare a proposal. And we did that. So uh, they were just reading the literature and going to scientific meetings and listening to, science, listening to scientific talks and reaching their own conclusions about who they might partner with in the United States. And then John, the, the year following, you were named Centennial Professor at Caltech. What was that like for you? But <laughs> it's a funny name. My colleague, my friends and colleagues, said, "Boy, I didn't know you were 100 years old." <laughs> Got that award, um, and uh, so I had to live with that a little bit. But that was um, that was a professorship that was. Um, I think I told you before was was uh, paid for by endowment that. Uh, some donors who wanted to remain anonymous were. So they, I asked them why they call it that, and it turned out it was given to me in the so-called anniversary, the centennial anniversary of Caltech. So they, they decided to call it that rather than their own name. And they continue to call it that as other people have had it. Um, so it was, it was a nice deal because I didn't have to worry about raising my salary anymore. And I had, uh, um, you know, freedom to use that money that I would have used to offset my salary partially to, to do different things than I would have done otherwise with my federal support. Um, so it, it meant monetarily that it was more worthwhile. I might also say that it was, um, I think it was awarded to me when I was considering moving from Caltech. And um, they were trying to, retain me, I think, in part by giving me this, this uh, professorship, but also um, by redoing my laboratories and so forth. So it was part of a package deal that eventually led to me staying at Caltech. Um, and uh, I'm glad I did, but um, I, had, I had a couple of offers at the time. I was, I was uh, entertaining a, a possibility of moving to UC Santa Barbara 
to, to take a chair that was just open there and they wanted me to, to come and take that chair. So maybe that was part of the thinking of Caltech awarding me the Centennial Professorship. But after I visited Santa Barbara several times, I decided I was going to move to a UC campus away from Caltech. I should probably go to the flagship campus. And uh, so um, I, I contacted people there, especially Bob Berkman, who was my former colleague at Caltech and had been at Berkeley for many years at that point. And that, that was uh, something I thought a lot more about. Um, in fact, they even went and looked at housing and so forth. And a, a big consideration is whether my wife would want to, want to move from Caltech. We both like Pasadena and uh, staying in the West would be good. And so I got pretty far along, but I eventually decided you couldn't beat the students at Caltech and the colleagues at Caltech. And, uh, so I decided to stay. And a few years later, I also got an offer from Harvard to move there. Uh, but that wasn't really a close call because Diane said, if you go to Boston, you're going alone. I'm not going with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> John, the, the so, offer the offer to so overhaul that. The, uh, the uh, offer to overhaul a laboratory, of course, gives you opportunity to think about new instruments new ways of looking at research problems. So on that point, what was moving into the mid-1990s? What was some of the work you were doing on olefin polymerization at that point? Um, I think I was winding that work down at that point. Um, we, were, we were still interested in uh, the, the origins of, of stereochemistry in you know, alpha olefin polymerization. Um, but at that point, um, I was getting more interested in other kinds of projects like carbon hydrogen bond activation and uh, work that could ultimately lead to um, hydrocarbon utilization, especially methane as a feedstock for making uh, liquid fuels and petrochemicals and so forth. And so I'd moved on from olefin polymerization into CH activation. Probably even before that, I was doing some of that. But um, the olefin polymerization work was sort of winding down. I did, um, I think that this was probably 10 years later than that, than the mid 90s. But I was interested in uh, one of BP's projects. One of my former students was working at one of the US laboratories at BP. And uh, he and some of his colleagues discovered a a chromium catalyzed process that took olefins to higher olefin, one higher olefin specifically, hexene, that's a trimer of ethylene, um, and it did so selectively. So I got interested in, in that kind of work, uh, and I maintained that interest all the way up to my retirement. Uh, in fact, I went back in the lab and was working on that in my, with my own hands when I, when I retired. Um, but the olefin polymerization field was at that point, it was well populated. People understood most of the essential features, um, and there really wasn't a lot of incentive to to do something truly novel in the old polymerization area, as far as I knew. So I was thinking about other areas. Now, and, given given uh, that I, this field I, gi given that this field came to maturity, pol uh, olefin polymerizations. What were some of the industrial applications at that point? How had it moved into industry? What did it make better socially, economically? I don't know about socially. Um, well, I think that um, people felt they understood well enough uh, to they understood how to, to engineer it and they were practicing it on enormous scales at that point. And the amount of polymers that were being made worldwide continued to increase at an uh, exceptional rate. I mean, a few percent per year is a lot. And so they were making more and more of these things, but I don't think that they really made any new products so, so much as made them more efficiently. And, um, they, they felt like they, they could predict now that they understood the fundamentals of things, predict with more confidence when they had a problem, you know, what were the possible reasons for a process that 
was giving them problems uh, and how to fix it. <clears throat> but I think that uh, I should I should go back and tell you that at the time when people like me and others were doing olefin polymerization work with with well-defined organometallic compounds as catalysts, there was a lot of skepticism in, in the polyolefin business. They thought, you're never going to beat the catalysts that we've developed by trial and error, these heterogeneous catalysts that, that were made by just mixing together various salts of titanium and aluminum, magnesium. Uh, these were very, very good, and they didn't think there was any room for improvement. But there was, there was a, a group of people that thought that this field really did have something to offer rather than just laying out the fundamentals in that they were single sided. Um, that is, there was a single catalytic site rather than a multiple sub group of sites that are working in parallel with one another. So they made much better polymer if that's really what you were after. That is to say, all of the polymer chains were, you know, more or less of the same length and they had the same, all of the polymers, alpha olefins had the same tacticity. Um, and that is, they were isotactic and, of course, syndiotactic. And these other catalysts that they were replacing had these multi-sided problems in that um, <clears throat> you couldn't, uh, you could get a uniform product out of it. And I should point out that some people noted that it's in some uses, it's good to have a mixture of polymers. And so these old fashioned catalysts actually had some advantages over these pure single sided catalysts. And um, so there was always a place for that. But um, let me give you one example. There's something called linear low density polyethylene that is a copolymer of ethylene and an alpha olefin, um, typically hexene or, or octene or even butene. And this allowed there to be uh, these side chains that came off of the long main chain of polyethylene that changed the properties uh, and made them softer and so forth. Um, and these old fashioned catalysts would do that, but not with the uh, uniformity of a single sided catalyst where you got um, uh, a uniform distribution of these side chains rather than having a lot of side chains at one end of the polymer and none at the other end of the polymer and so forth. And so that gave uh, new kinds of linear low density polyethylene, and especially Dow uh, was very proud that they were able to uh, take these, these new organometallic catalysts and sort of dial in the properties that the customer wanted, you know, things like melting point, temperature, uh, the, uh, the rigidity of the polymer, the brittle, or not so brittle characters and so forth that the, that the customer wanted from now. So they were, they could right away, they could, could make the polymer that they wanted to make. And they used mixtures of, of homogeneous catalysts together to make um, uh, block copolymers that had you know, soft segments and hard segments and so forth. So they were they were playing around with these new catalysts uh, at, at Dow and making really fundamental breakthroughs in the kinds of things, kinds of polymers that you could make. Whether they had you know widespread use, I can't really say. You'd have to ask Dow, but I I know that they were uh, touted in the you know the literature as having. Uh, new and improved properties and so forth. So there was some of that stuff going on. <clears throat> but, uh, and the companies did a lot of, of uh, innovative things with single-sided catalysts that the organometallic community provided. For. So in the end, I think everyone figured out that there was a place for the old catalysts and they still make a lot of those. And there was a place for the new ones. Early on, industry would not want to practice, most of industry would not want to practice making polyethylene using a, a solution of an organometallic compound because they had engineered all of their reactors, these enormous reactors, uh, to use these solid old fashioned catalysts that were powders that they sprayed into the reactor. 
And they figured out early on that you could take these organometallic compounds and support them on something like silica particles. Uh, and they figured out how to do that. But they lost some activity, but they maintained their single-sided advantages. And so that sort of merged some of the old technologies with the newer catalyst. And so they they made uh, everything that was made from these organometallic compounds, well-defined organometallic compounds, was immediately supported on silica and used in the reactors, just like the old-fashioned catalysts were used. Uh, so there was there was a give and take between industry and academics, and some of us academics figured out what might be going on when you supported them this way or that way. Uh, and uh, so I think that uh, the, the polyolefin industry has come to the realization they need to find out a way to make a recyclable or biodegradable version of what they're using. And uh, I was at a meeting a couple of years ago, uh, so-called polyolefin meeting, where, and I've been to many of those, uh, they're held every other year. I've been to probably five or 10 of those in the past. And the, talk, the topics were wide and varied and they talk about economics and engineering as, as well as the chemistry going on. Uh, but this past, this past meeting was almost totally focused on uh, how are we going to make a biodegradable or, uh, or, or recyclable polyolefin that we, so we don't have to pollute the world uh, with all of this, these polyolefins that people are making and throwing away. Uh, <clears throat> and so th I think that there, that's a big focus of the polyolefin business now is to, is to finally reconcile that these things are really making a mess of, of oceans and you know all these other uh, places where polyolefins end up and are very slow to biodegrade. Uh, they don't really biodegrade. They're sort of decomposed by partial oxidation, usually sunlight promotes that and so forth. But uh, <clears throat> so there's a there's a change in emphasis more recently toward uh, making something as inexpensive as a polyolefin uh, that has some recyclable or biodegradable properties as well. And that's a big, tall order, uh, especially because there's so much uh, polyolefin made, uh, making it with, you know, making something that's not a polyolefin that takes its place without a big cost increase is going to be a real challenge. And they know that, so. John, on that topic, what were some of the advances in M NMR spectroscopy that were relevant for this research? Well, I think it goes, it goes back to uh, scientists at Bell Laboratories. Usually NMR was used by, by chemists to look at solutions of, you know, uniform molecules, of not mixtures like what you have in polymers. Uh, and the, uh, the NMR spectroscopist figured out how to quantify the pure, the stereochemical purity of things like polypropylene early on. In fact, my colleague, Jack Roberts, used to consult with some of those people. And well, I think one of his former students was the per person at the labs that was involved in that research. <clears throat> and it was a real, a really uh, cool application of the NMR. Um, the, the, the NMR spectrometers were getting better and better at resolving very small chemical shift differences. Uh, and so you could get very high quality spectra, even though these polymers at room temperature are, of course, solid. So you have to dissolve them in some sort of solvent and uh, if you run them in, in, a, in a solvent at a high temperature, like, I don't know, 100, 150 degrees centigrade Celsius, <clears throat> they, uh, they give high quality spectra. And you can, if you go through the statistics, you can say how pure, for example, an isotactic polymer is by just looking at the NMR spectrum. And 
and how what the impurities are and that, that that actually told people by NMR what the mechanism was for stereo control. Um, and maybe I could explain that a little bit. Um, so if you have a, a, a poly a polypropylene segment and you look and make it quite long, if all the methyl groups went in in the same orientation, that is say they're coming off of toward you off of uh, off the main chain, then you get a single resonance for all the methyl groups and because the chains are so long, you you, uh, you don't have to worry about you know how close to the end it is. It's just it all looks uniform if you have you know a degree of polarization of you know a thousand or something like that. Um, and if if there's one methyl group that goes back instead of forward, uh, like all the others, that will give a characteristic methyl resonance for uh, the neighboring methyls to that mistake, or what you call it going back a mistake, relative to the correct orientation. And so if you get far enough away, those methyl groups can't sense the mistake, but the ones close to it, to the mistake, give you an idea of how it happens. And so if it makes a mistake and the stereochemistry is dictated by the orientation of the last inserted monomer for the new monomer to move up, then it will continue that mistake and all the rest of them will go back uh, instead of forward. And that will give rise to a, a characteristic set of resonances around those mistakes that you can, by statistics, you can quantify. Whereas if, if the if the way in which a mistake occurs is not dictated by the last inserted monomer's orientation, but by the chirality of the catalyst site uh, that you may purposely change by introducing chirality in the metallocene, then after it makes a mistake, it will go back and correct itself. And that will give a totally different kind of uh, signal right around where the mistake was coming. So we, we could tell early on in the, in the single site catalyst business for making polypropylene, how it worked. And it worked largely by, in almost all cases, by the chirality of the metal dictating how it should go in. <coughs> um, and so there's, there's naturally going to be this background of uh, the chiral influence of the last inserted monomer, but that's a relatively minor influence compared to the chirality at the catalyst site. So that's that's an example of how carbon-13, especially NMR spectroscopy, has uh, influenced the polyolefin business. Um, and we use that routinely. Uh, we also did some experiments that uh, uh, that show the influence of the hydrogen uh, carbon bonds right close to the metal in the insertion step, the so-called alpha gostic assistance of all of an insertion, that we came up with some tests uh, based on isotope effects. Actually, the concept was really uh, that came out of the Grubbs group, and they looked for uh, isotope effects and, and, and in support or not in support of the so-called alpha gostic effect that um, was in the popular literature. And we came up with some experiments where we were able to, to, to uh, make um, olefin, olefins that had deuteriums and hydrogens along the chain in various ways. And we were able from that uh, experiment that we did to show that there was indeed an isotope effect of about the right magnitude to be involved in the exertion. And that had a crucial uh, role in uh, the stereochemistry, again, of the propylene polymerizations, it showed that uh, <clears throat> there is an alpha carbon hydrogen bond. That is, the carbon, there are two carbon hydrogen bonds right next to the, to the metal when the next propylene moves up. And one of those two CH bonds coordinates to the metal uh, as the olefin is inserting. And people had done some experiments to uh, to show that that might well be the case. And there were people doing theory that you could calculate that, yeah, that would give, give you a favorable 
uh, influence on the rate of insertion if you had this alpha hydrogen coordinating as the olefin inserted. <clears throat> so we we did uh, NMR experiments based on deuterium NMR in that case, where we could tell the isotope effect and the direction of the isotope effect and the magnitude of the isotope effect. And all those were in accord with that. So we did several experiments like that and uh, published those kinds of papers in DAX and they got quite a bit of attention. Um, so NMR was crucial to us uh, in doing these kinds of experiments. In addition to just allowing us to establish the structure of our uh, intermediates on the way to chiral catalysts and stereo, stereo uh, we also did uh, diastereomeric determinations to get the purity of the chirality if we resolved it into one enantiomer. All of these kinds of things were crucially dependent on NMR. And, and NMR was amazingly powerful in, in providing answers to these questions. John, moving into the mid-90s, the late 90s, as you were getting more interested in hydrocarbon research, what was the relevance of this to companies like BP? What was their interest in this research? Um, well, this was one of the grand challenges that BP uh, researchers identified. I think all, all of the petroleum companies were interested in carbon hydrogen bond activation. And, and the interest that BP was in, initially at least, was in uh, taking methane and making a liquid fuel out of it. Uh, you could partially oxidize it uh, to methanol cleanly. <clears throat> methanol is a liquid. It can be used as a fuel substitute. It's like ethanol. Uh, you can use it and, and you can distribute it in, in, in a in the same way they distribute gasoline, you know, they can pump it out of a tank and, and, and the service station. And uh, <coughs> so they were interested in that or making maybe oxidatively coupling methane with with oxygen to to make water and higher alkanes, uh, maybe even octane. Like that, so they would have a, a synthetic gasoline that was made by partial oxidation of methane to uh, to gasoline, um, so there was the, there was a lot of thinking that there was more and more methane being found around the world, and there was even what I later found was sort of a apocryphal uh, notion that that there was stranded gas in places you know that were hard to get to and you couldn't couldn't drill a gas well easily in these locations. There's also a lot of a lot of methane hydrate. In fact, most of the methane is in the form of a hydrate in the Arctic, where the methane is surrounded by water molecules and the solid uh, methane containing ice. And uh, so they wanted to uh, utilize that that kind of methane as well, uh, without pumping it out, just melting and collecting the methane and then partially oxidizing it. But moving methane around was recognized as being a very expensive proposition because obviously it's a gas. Uh, it's a major component of natural gas. Uh, varies, but it's always you know eighty or ninety percent at least methane. Um, and so getting natural gas to a location where you need to use it is expensive. Uh, any way you think of it, if you can build a pipeline, we have lots of those. Uh, we also liquefy methane. It doesn't easily liquefy, but you can you can refrigerate it and compress it into a liquid. And <clears throat> that's uh, moved around the earth uh, on these ships that have liquefied methane in these like giant thermos bottles that are well insulated. And uh, so that's an expensive thing to, come, to make that much you know, liquid methane out of gaseous methane takes a lot of energy. And again, it's not very green. You have to create that energy by usually by burning something, maybe methane, to liquefy more methane. Um, so 
they, they were thinking, wow, it would be great if we could just take at the source, you know, whether it's methane class rate, that's what this methane and ice is, and melted it, or we could uh, think it, take it out of the ground in a, in, a, in a well and partially oxidize it on site uh, to a liquid fuel, either synthetic gasoline or make methanol, which is liquid again, and ship it around that way without having to pay the price and uh, the pollution caused by taking it to a liquid and then moving it. So there was a lot of interest in using methane as a as a as a way to make liquid fuels rather than taking petroleum and refining it into its various components. Um, of course, it would be a lot cleaner burning if it was made from pure natural gas. It wouldn't have all the sulfur and nitrogen uh, impurities that that uh, we're always dealing with, and these are ultimately polluting uh, the atmosphere with, with things like sulfur, sulfur oxides and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so there was a lot of impetus, and this had, this had been known for, for a very long time, that it would be great if we could, could, could do something with methane other than just burn it. Uh, and the real challenge was that it wasn't so much getting oxygen and methane to react with one another. It was getting them to react in a selective way that would make uh, only methanol rather than the thermodynamic products, which are carbon dioxide and water. And of course, that's what we get when we light a methane source, you know, stream of methane in the air is we create heat because that's what we want. But you make carbon dioxide and water as byproducts. You don't make no uh, detectable amounts of methanol or higher hydrocarbons like gasoline when you, when you oxidize methane. It usually finds a way to go completely downhill to the unwanted products. Uh, although, of course, the byproduct is you get the maximum heat that way. Um, so, um, it had been known that it would be great to do all these things, but everybody who tried to partially oxidize methane with oxygen was frustrated. There were lots of people trying to devise catalysts like they had to devise catalysts for making polyolefins by trial and error, usually with solid materials that they pass oxygen and methane over and looked at the, the products that came out. But there was a there was sort of a ceiling in yield that was very low. Only a few percent um, of the methane would go to, to things like methanol rather than all the way to carbon dioxide and water. <clears throat> and this, uh, this was, this was a very frustrating thing. They tried many, many times to do this. And I think most people had just given up, although some, some people were still playing around trying to find these catalysts by, by trial and error. So there was there was a long-standing issue there, but the payoff was just so enormous. If, if somebody dis discovered a catalyst that would selectively take to methane to methanol with oxygen, uh, it would completely change the energy landscape. Uh, it would make everything greener. Uh, that uses petrochemicals, and that would be uh, something that, of course, BP or Exxon or, or Dow or Shell would would love to do. Uh, they would like to be there first, uh, and you know, reap the benefits of having a new catalyst that uh, is a lot more selective and in a good way. <coughs> so, anyway, that was the thinking. We need to we need to get hydrocarbons to selectively go to liquid fuel. Uh, there was also uh, a smaller scale. There were people who sort of cringe when they think, "Well, what do we do with methane? We burn it. That's pretty much all we do." Uh, even in the chemical industry, they they burn methane to to propel, you know, to to furnish the energy needed for all of the processes they're doing to make petrochemicals. Uh, 
not only from methane, but from other things. So, so uh, it was sort of sad for us chemists to, to see that all, we're going to take all the methane we have on Earth and we're going to just burn it when it's a beautiful, possible starting material to make other kinds of things like petrochemicals. Maybe you could even make polyethylene from methane um, by partial oxidation. Um, <clears throat> so that was that was the impetus that these companies, they knew it was a, a very important area for them to work in, but all of the prior research frustrated them in finding the right kind of catalysts. John, tell me about your visiting professorship at Harvard in 1999. Um, I, think, I think I was there for only a week. Are you sure it was? This was the Robert Burns Woodward a... visiting professor at Harvard. Yeah. Yeah. I visited for a whole week. Oh, I see. And I, gave, <laughs> I gave several lectures. <clears throat> so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't so grand. Yes. Although uh, Woodward was, Woodward had passed, but he was such a hero in chemistry at Harvard. They maintained his office in sparkling condition and it was wood paneling and it was very very luxurious and i got to sit in that office for the week i was there but their their main reason for giving me that lectureship was it i think it was like the second or third day they took me over to my my, my friend who was the dean of science and arts and sciences at harvard at the time and his name is jeremy knowles and jeremy you know, went to the to the dean's office, you know, where the president of Harvard sits also. And <clears throat> I went in his office and he handed me an envelope with an offer <laughs> to come to Harvard and join the faculty. So I think they were they were just making life look like a grandiose thing for me that week. It was it was fun because a number of my former colleagues were on, on the faculty at Harvard. They had moved to Harvard and uh, I guess I'd like to think that they were they were pushing for them for Harvard to make me an offer because they enjoyed having me as a colleague at Caltech. So, um, and I had many friends there as well. I mean, Harvard Harvard is a great place. I mean, no question about it. But the style was very different. Uh, it's it's much more. I don't know. I guess I can use the word uptight. Uh, the faculty are. Uh, you know, they're, they're less prone to collaborate. They're less prone to, uh, you know, work together and not compete with one another. And that's one of the great things about Caltech I, I really loved. Um, and I think they they loved it too, but they, they wanted to be at Harvard. Most of the people that uh, moved uh, from Caltech were the organic chemists and the Harvard had the best organic group of professors in, in the world. Uh, and <clears throat> there weren't any, uh, there wasn't a comparable effort in inorganic chemistry. And they had many people criticizing their department for being so uh, focused on organic chemistry and physical chemistry as well, um, but in biochemistry, but not so much inorganic chemistry. I was, in fact, uh, uh, on the, I think they call it the board of visitors for uh, the, the provost and the deans to, to bring in and to look at the department and write a report and say, you know, what's the status of our, our chemistry department at Harvard? Is it, is it great? Where is it great? Where do we need to, to, to improve it? And when I was on those committees, I always pointed out that they needed to get a really comparable effort in inorganic chemistry. And so they remembered that. I told them they should hire two people at the same time because they were having so much difficulty <coughs> moving somebody that they really wanted uh, in inorganic chemistry. So I said that if you have two people, you'll have a better sh chance. And it turned out while I was at Harvard, they, they uh, approached a young guy at MIT and and said, we're, we're making Burkhall an offer. We'd like you to come with him to, uh, to Harvard. And uh, we were good friends, so that 
in fact, they even brought him over from MIT one morning and we sat and talked to each other. I remember the first thing, his name was Kit Cummins. He's actually my academic grandson. He worked uh, <clears throat> as an undergraduate with one of my former students. Anyway, he, he, he sat down in the office in the, Bur in the Robert Burns uh, office and, and the first thing he said was, you're not going to Harvard, are you, John? And I said, I, I don't think so, Ken. His nickname is Ken. And, and I said, are you? And he said, no, I like him. I can't want to stay there. <laughs> so even though they were being very clever in this one-week lectureship that I had there, uh, and, uh, the, the odds weren't very good. They weren't surprised when we got to them. <laughs> John, on the, so, on the topic of... He is, on the topic of grandiosity, that same year in 1999, the American Institute of Chemists named you a chemical pioneer. Was that more of a lifetime achievement award, or was that in recognition of a specific pioneering aspect of your research? Uh, I think it's probably the former. <clears throat> the American Institute of Chemists is not uh, anywhere close to the stature of the American Chemical Society. <laughs> uh, and I don't even think I belong to the American Institute of Chemists, um, or I ever have belonged. But they, they recognize people through this one award, uh, and it does have some stature. I, I shouldn't you know, put it down completely, but it, it wasn't something that, you know, made the same impression on, on you as getting an actual award from the American Chemical Society. Um, but yeah, the, I guess their big award was the chemical pioneer. And I was, a, I was an inorganic chemist and they selected an inorganic chemist occasionally. And you know, so I won that award once. Somebody dominated me. <laughs> Another award that year, I, I'm curious. Since we're talking about hydrocarbons, the George Ola Award on uh, on for hydrocarbon or petroleum energy was this more aspirational? Given the, the was it more about the promise of where hydrocarbon research could go, or even as early as 1999, there was really a significant body of research at that point? Yeah, I think it was based on our fundamental work in CH activation of hydrocarbons. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's why I got that award. George Ola was a friend of mine. He, he was um, a chemist at Dow when he did his Nobel Prize winning work. Uh, and he eventually moved to uh, the Loker Hydrocarbon Institute at, at the University of Southern California. And we used to uh, visit with him occasionally, go over there for joint seminar and so forth, but he also had a joint grant with us. I was familiar with him. Uh, he was a real character, and uh, I was pleased to get that award. The reason they, they named the award in his name uh, was that he did the Nobel Prize winning work by showing he could add a proton to a hydrocarbon, even things like methane. Uh, will take a proton and make CH5 plus a cationic uh, molecule, carbocation is it's called. Then George did a lot of fundamental work on making and characterizing carbocations in very uh, unusually acidic media solvent systems and so forth. So he was always pushing uh, hydrocarbons and about the time that that award was created, he was writing a book <clears throat> on uh, methanol and all of the glorious things methanol could be used to do and, and how we should convert methane to methanol. Um, of course, he didn't have a process for doing it yet, but he said if we did have a process, this would be a really great thing. And it got a lot of attention. So. George Ola and hydrocarbons were sort of synonymous. Uh, uh, he was he was a, a, a very good friend, as I said, and he used to call me uh, on the phone when I published a paper and he didn't like something in the title or some minute 
you know, part of the paper that he picked up on, and he would try to correct me. And I would always be very patient with George because I liked him. But he would call me and he'd say, now, John, this paper is a very nice piece of work, but you have to get away from using this term for this process because it's not anything new. We discovered that many years ago. <laughs> so I would listen. Yes, George. I understand, George. But, but you know, I was I was visiting US, USC um, a couple of years before he died, and he was very kind to me always. He, he made a special effort to come in. He wasn't feeling well. He died a couple of years later. Uh, and after I retired, my, it turned out my doctor uh, that I was going to retire also, and I asked him to suggest some people that I might take on as a, my new professor, my new doctor, and um, he he suggested a guy named Ron Ola, <laughs> and uh, I said, "Isn't that George Ola's son?" And he said, "Yeah, he's a good, he's a very good doctor." So I, I ended up going to him. I still got to him, and he has a lot of George's characteristics too. But, He's a fantastic doctor. So George Ola still sort of lives with me in a way uh, through his son. But uh, but yeah, that was a very nice award. I was pleased. That usually goes to uh, somebody doing heterogeneous catalysis, not homogeneous catalysis. And I think uh, George was impressed that I could uh, could do work in hydrocarbons with with homogeneous catalysts. John, to drill down a bit deeper into CH bond activation, something that you wrote about in some detail, you talked about CH bond activation as something that needed to be understood before it was exploited. I wonder if you can reflect a little bit about that. What, what needed to be understood about CH bond activation and how did you envision that research being able to exploit it? Yeah. Um, well, I hesitate to say that we're going to connect fundamental research so quickly to exploitation or application. Um, some, some people would argue that a lot of catalysts, but most of the catalysts that we have that we use already you know, that activate CH bonds were discovered not by understanding the fundamentals, but by just trying different things and seeing what things work. Um, and so that these people are skeptical that fundamental research really has a place in catalyst development and exploitation. Um, fortunately, I think they're in the, mi they're in the minority. Uh, most people think that understanding fundamentals really leads you uh, to application. Uh, maybe not in such a direct line, maybe not even in a way in which you can sort of explain very clearly and logically. It's just sort of, an, it builds your intuition about what things to try and where to, where to look for a, a new kind of way of activating CH bonds and so forth. But, <clears throat> but the, the real driver for CH activation is this partial oxidation goal. Uh, and we know it can be done because nature does it, uh, although she does it at, in a very elaborate and expensive way. For example, there, there are a class of enzymes called methane monooxygenases. That's exactly what you want. You want to put one oxygen, a monooxygen, into uh, the CH, one of the CH bonds to make methanol. And indeed, these methane monooxygenases are are, uh, are, are catalysts based on transition metal compounds. Um, and so it can be done, but the way in which nature does it doesn't look like it's going to be very easy uh, for us to duplicate. For example, the reason that nature takes methane and converts it to methanol so selectively is not so much that the chemistry is... <clears throat> The detailed chemistry is uh, selected as it is that once it makes methanol, the, the binding site is rejects the methanol and expels it from the active site before it can get 
recharged, if you like, for further oxidation. And building such an elaborate channel with a synthetic catalyst would just be prohibitively expensive. Nature's had, as they say, a long time to develop these things by evolution. And uh, so if it works and it's really required, uh, it will be duplicated and uh, a, a synthetic catalyst has not, never been built that I know of that has that feature where it expels the hydropho the hydrophilic methanol from the hydrophobic site where it was created from oxygen and methane. Um, <clears throat> so we know there's some ways to do that, but uh, maybe if we keep discovering new ways to activate CH bonds, we can that will build our intuition so that we will speed up the discovery of the catalyst that actually functions well. Got come close. There, there, there are some, there are some, there were some catalysts that actually. This goes back to how I got interested in this. The earliest way we looked at uh, activating CH bonds was with these early transition metals, the ones that are very electropositive that coordinate the CH bond and smoothly uh, exchange it with a hydrogen or a carbon already on the metal, <clears throat> but. My colleague, uh, Jay Levinger, uh, and I decided to check a report that came from a Russian chemist named Alex Shilov and his crew, uh, where he claimed that you could take very simple platinum salts, platinum halides, dissolve them in water, and heat them just above the boiling point of water in the presence of methane and make methanol with, uh, with oxygen. <coughs> Sorry, not with oxygen, with was uh, well, the platinum salts get reduced, uh, and not the oxygen, but um, that's sort of jumping ahead where we tried to couple those things to oxygen uh, reduction. But in any case, we, we couldn't believe that something as uh, undistinguished as platinum halides in water would do something so elaborate as break a carbon hydrogen bond of methane and, and add an OH group of water. Uh, so quickly. And so we decided to check on that, and that's how we got interested in the so-called Shulov chemistry. So I guess we and others named it that because he he made he made these claims in the Russian literature, and and Jay and I just couldn't believe that it would be true. We thought somehow the platinum got reduced to platinum particles, and on the surface there was some reaction that took place, like uh, heterogeneous this catalyst based on platinum metal. Um, we weren't sure exactly what that was, but we just couldn't believe that platinum chloride would survive uh, uh, to do the reaction. So we decided to, since Shilov hadn't used NMR spectroscopy or any other sort of standard techniques, we decided to check it. So we, we wrote a proposal for some seed money and we got that seed money from the department to support a postdoc and it went in and we didn't, we decided not to work with methane right away. We worked with it later. Well, we just try a CH bond of another molecule like methyl group on a benzene ring to make it uh, water soluble. We put a sulfonate group on the opposite side of the benzene ring and paratyline sulfonate was put in D2O and <clears throat> heated with platinum salts. And by NMR spectroscopy, we could see it was not only looking at the NMR tube, it, it wasn't precipitating platinum, at least not visibly. Uh, uh, but we could see by NMR, sure enough, the methyl group was getting converted to, to a, a, the CH bond was getting converted to an OH, carbon OH bond. Uh, so we were making, uh, uh, we were making the alcohol from the methyl group and that was amazing enough, but even more amazing to a chemist <clears throat> was that if you kept heating it, some of the OH group, some of the alcohol, the CH2OH, would be converted to the aldehyde, the benzaldehyde. Um, and that was even slower than the methyl group going to the, to the hydroxyl group. It was completely backwards from everything organic chemists thought because it's much easier to oxidize an alcohol than it is an alkane. 
<laughs> so the aldehyde was forming, but very slowly. And then a, a next level of amazement was that the aldehyde was an oxidized on to the acid, the so benzoic acid. So, and, and that is the, we know from organic chemistry, that's an even easier oxidation is to take an aldehyde to, to a carboxylic acid. Uh, so there were, there were some really novel things going on here. And we began to be certainly believers that Shalab was correct. We eventually did look at methane, and indeed it is oxidized uh, to methanol. <coughs> so we studied all of those things, and uh, um, we, we got more money to, to look at it. I shifted some of my uh, National Science Foundation funding to support some grad students. We started doing fundamental studies on how exactly the Shilov chemistry took place on uh, all kinds of hydrocarbons. And we uh, devised something called the Shilov cycle, where <clears throat> there were three stages of the reaction that took place. And we studied the detailed mechanism of each of those three stages. And ultimately found out why Shilov chemistry works and related things don't work so well. Um, and uh, I guess we could go into the details there, but uh, I, I think I'll just say that over the years, we laid out the relative rates of, you know, alkane versus alcohol versus aldehyde oxidation and uh, got quantified data on them and so forth. Uh, and the, the surprising thing was Compared to the traditional way in which you oxidize things, the Shalom chemistry was not very selective. It oxidized a methyl group at about the same rate it oxidized an alcohol, um, and an aldehyde was much slower. So um, that meant that there was fundamentally something very different about the way in which this platinum chloride uh, uh, precursor was converted into a <coughs> platinum species that was soluble but liked carbon-hydrogen bonds of alkanes uh, and activated them. So we, we spent a lot of time and uh, money and uh, uh, thought uh, trying to understand the Shilaw system. <clears throat> and ultimately, we, we did find a way in which to take uh, one component of the platinum. There was it turned out you needed a mixture of platinum-2 and platinum-4. And the platinum-2 activated the CH bond, and the platinum-4 oxidized that uh, product <clears throat> to uh, a platinum-4 material that was reactive toward water. So that's how the cycle worked. And we figured out a way in which we could take the copper and replace the platinum-4 with copper-2, copper-2 chloride, and <clears throat> used a copper two, copper one cycle instead of the platinum four two as the oxidation cycle. And the advantage of that is that you can reoxidize copper one with dioxygen. So now you ultimately are taking dioxygen into water as you're making the methane into methanol. So uh, that was the, the 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 nice thing to do was to couple that. We got several turnovers. Uh, in that way, we got maybe a hundred or a couple of hundred turnovers before it all, all shut down. Uh, but uh, at least in principle, we demonstrated that you could do these reactions and you could do them in a, a completely, <laughs> not completely, but nearly uh, in non selective way. Uh, but that turns out to be better than. The selective way, which takes methane and oxygen and makes water and CO2 out of it. So <clears throat> we were, we were uh, doing something practical uh, on, on a very, very small scale. But the, the problem is so enormous because nobody wants to use, certainly not use platinum as an oxidant because uh, it's, you know, platinum is a very expensive element. Uh, Everybody wanted to use oxygen ultimately. Uh, and if we could catalytically do it, great. But doing it on a scale where you would 
it needs so much platinum, even if it's very efficient catalyst, uh, to do this on a, on a scale that would have any impact on how you make methanol. Uh, is uh, it's hard to imagine. So I think we have the fundamentals, but uh, the, the really difficult thing is taking those fundamentals and having a very creative person somehow devise a way to make it work on, on, on such a scale, with such efficiency that we would actually replace the way we make methanol now. You might be interested in how we make methanol now. We take methanol, we take methane, Methane is a precursor, and we heat it up with steam, and we make carbon monoxide and hydrogen out of that. <clears throat> and then we take the hydrogen and the carbon monoxide, and we pass it over a catalyst. It's, it's actually a copper catalyst it's with zinc promotion, heterogeneous catalyst. And that catalyst is heterogeneous, but it's selective, and it makes methanol in high yield. Uh, so we make all our meth methanol nail white oxidizing methane, but we steam reform it first. And so we have to heat it really hot and drive that reaction uh, that's normally would go back the other direction. We drive it at really high temperatures to, to uh, CO and hydrogen. And then we take it back downhill to methanol using the cattle. So uh, it's, it's a very expensive energy wise process, but it works really well. So replacing it with something that only turns over a couple hundred times is not on. Nobody in industry is going to do that. John, moving into the early 2000s, tell me about the origins of the MC2 program at Caltech. Yeah, we called it MC squared. Uh, oh, MC and squared. it was it was <laughs> like 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 Einstein's you know, uh, energy mass. In interconversion. Um, so the M, the, the M stood for methane. Uh, conversion consortium. That's what the CC was. Okay. It was methane conversion. It didn't have to be converted to methanol, but something useful. It was a liquid fuel or a petrochemical. Uh, anyway, it was their name. And uh, a, a group of of uh, scientists from the managers from, from BP were told by the, the CEO at that time, Lord John Brown, uh, who was a physicist, uh, that, but he had this vision for supporting academic research and that he would uh, establish these uh, sort of grand consortia between BP and the university. And some of them were in physics, some of the other areas, but this there was going to be one in chemistry, and he decided it was going to be in methane conversion technologies. So they, I think they had in mind that they would identify some university that had people working in the area of methane chemistry um, that would um, stimulate the development of, of some of these technologies we've talked about. But they came up with a list. I don't remember how many universities they invited, but two of them were Caltech and Berkeley. Uh, I know one of them was Illinois. It could have been Texas A&M, I think, was another one. But these all had people working in the area of methane chemistry in some, some way. Uh, and, and they invited us to, uh, they came to, to me and to Jay Leibniger and said, you've been publishing on this platinum work. We're very interested in it. Um, we would like to encourage you to write a proposal to attract these funds to Caltech. And we'd like you to identify at Caltech people in your department that would um, be part of this consortium with, with BP. And uh, so we organized a group of people. We discussed what we would put in the proposal. Um, and we submitted a written proposal to them. I guess we made the first cut because they sent a group of about I don't know, five people to Caltech to listen to our presentations of what we would do with the money. And uh, in the end, they decided that they, they wanted to support two schools. One was Caltech and one was Berkeley. 
And so the Caltech people were supposed to be the chemists working on the problem. The Berkeley team was supposed to take the more chemical engineering approach to the problem. But Berkeley, Caltech, and VP would be the MC squared uh, um, consortium. And <clears throat> so we met with with BP scientists regularly. They came to Caltech once a year. We went to a BP site once a year, um, and we talked about our results and we talked about wh where we might go next and so forth. So that, that was a that was a wonderful thing uh, for, for Caltech. Uh, it, it involved not only methane conversion, but at the outset. They liked Harry Gray so much, they decided that they wanted to do something in photochemistry. So, uh, photo, photo, well, solar energy conversion, I guess I should call it. <clears throat> Even though BP had a very small effort in that area, they, they thought Harry was making great progress. And so, we had not only people working on methane, but also on solar energy conversion. Uh, and um, so, that was how it started. Uh, it was supposed to be 10 years, um, and it had very generous funding, 10 years, and then it was going to be ended. And at about year five, um, we went to BP and we reported on our first five years of progress because they had, they had a, a clause in the agreement that they could terminate it if they didn't think we were making good progress. And interestingly, the person at BP that um, that was in charge of that program, of the MZ Squared Consortium, uh, was uh, my former provost, Steve Coonan. <laughs> and Steve's a physicist, but he, he and I are con we're contemporaries at Caltech. He, he, uh, he and I were on a lot of committees, institute committees together. So I knew Steve very really well, even before he was my provost. But he he was the one who was sitting in the audience when we were proving that we need we deserve the next five years. In fact, he agreed with us and agreed that we should have an inflationary increase. So he gave us even more money. So Steve was very good to us too. Um, and uh, it, then after ten years, they decided they still liked it so much that they they reduced the scope of our problems. And Harry's project was showed it off to, to uh, NSF support because Harry got a lot of support for his solar energy research program. Um, and BP stopped funding Harry, uh, continued funding people like Jay and, and me and also Bob Grubbs and a young colleague at Caltech. And uh, so we, we had about half as many people as we started with and we got a reduced amount of funding, but they continued for another seven years before they <clears throat> ultimately said, okay, this is this is the end. I think in part because I had decided I was going to retire <laughs> at about that time. So, uh, but I don't think there's ever been a BP program that lasted that long where university support was provided. And, you know, on reflection, I think it was... <clears throat> Such a hard problem, they didn't expect that we would solve it, even after 17 years. <clears throat> but we certainly made progress, to, uh, and I think they saw that. And I guess they didn't really hire very many of our people, so they weren't really trying to get Caltech graduates and postdocs to come and work at BP. They were doing that sort of at the same rate they were before. But I think what they wanted to do was sort of outsource their fundamental research efforts in this area and have some group of people working in the area and watching the area closely so that if somebody made a breakthrough, whether it was us or some other group, we would we would know about it early and we would have a, a valid opinion of how correct it was uh, if a claim was made. So, so they sort of kept, kept us as their ear to the ground for fundamental research in the area of you know, methane and natural gas conversion to liquid fuels, petrochemicals. And I think they felt good about it. They were sort of torn between 
whether we should be doing something practical for all this money. I mean, what are, we, what are they getting for their money? They would occasionally say at one of these meetings. But fortunately, the managers of the program kept saying, we don't want you to work on these problems that are close to application. Um, I have a lot of problems with patent uh, intellectual property issues and so forth uh, <clears throat> if you do that. But we want you to use your own creativity in taking the program in different directions. And uh, we don't want you to just do what you know we already are doing. Um, so so the, I think in the end, both the managers and, the, and scientists are were, were quite happy with it. I, I'm still very good friends with some of the chemists that work at BP and we're working in organometallic chemistry. Uh, and so, although they're not supporting me anymore, I still, I still keep in touch with them. And uh, so I know that they were very happy with it. John, what would you say at the end of the day were some of the achievements of this collaboration? Well, essentially all of our fundamental work on the Shiloh cycle was done with BP funding. It started out with my NSF grant, as I said, and this little seed money that we got from, from uh, the Division of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering. But, um, but all, most of the research was done with BP funding. And it, it, went, it went from using methane as a substrate. To, uh, so I told you about how we worked out the Shiloh cycle. Then we decided that we should really look at uh, ways to make uh, higher hydrocarbons from carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Uh, this is a, a longstanding problem also. I told you that we could make methanol with, with the coppers and catalysts very selectively, but if you try to make gasoline from this carbon monoxide hydrogen mixture called syn gas, as you synthesize other things from it, uh, uh, there's there's a you know there's a messy product mixture that you get is essentially crude oil, uh, and uh, they were interested in making more selective conversions making something maybe more than just higher alkanes, which is what this process called fisher trucks does, uh, but making olefins and higher yields and more, more valuable petrochemicals, make, make olefins from making polyolefins from methane through CO and hydrogen. So we stepped back and said, okay, we're going to have to use methane and steam reform it into CO and hydrogen. Now, what kinds of fundamental processes can we envision there? And we did a lot of fundamental work in that area as well. Uh, and then uh, toward the end, they were they were funding work that I was doing with a, a postdoc or two in this area of olefin trimerization catalysis. And uh, <clears throat> I think some of the some of the breakthroughs we did there were of great interest to the to the uh, BP scientists who were interested in lubricants, because we showed that we we could come up with a catalyst that would selectively trimerize not only ethylene to make one, one hexene, but would it would even trimerize things like hexene and make a C18 product, um, and it would do very it would do it very selectively. Or, uh, you can make C15 or C5 and so forth. Um, and these things turn out to be uh, made in industry, but again, you get ugly mixtures by the way they do it now. And so synthetic lubricants like mobile one, uh, synthetic oil that we put in our automobiles um, are really uh, created by very non-selective processes and here we were making selectively a C18, which is uh, sort of like uh, one of the components, a very minor component of the way they're doing it now. So, so in the end, they were very interested in that work as well. Um, and we had, we've re actually written patents and so forth in that area and had them ready. So, um, so we had a whole raft of different projects, not only methane conversion, but also syngas conversion uh, and uh, light olefin conversion. 
uh, processes that we were in, interested in, and they were interested too. Uh, uh, the scientists were very, very interested in having pure samples of, of these products that we were making in the end there to, to try to figure out what component of synthetic oil was the most desirable and how we might uh, make only that and not these other things that cause problems. Um, so, <clears throat> so I think those are the, the sort of the scope of the projects that we're looking at. Uh, and, and they were they were quite willing for us to look at almost all of those processes if we thought they were worth, you know, dedicating a grad student or a postdoc to. That was good enough for them. John, tell me about being a Seaborg scholar at Los Alamos. Was that more like the Harvard one week thing, or was that a longer engagement? No, that was a longer engagement. Um, I think I may have been the first Seaborg scholar. Anyway, you, you probably have heard of Glenn Seaborg. Of course, he was he was a yeah okay he was a chemist who really understood the the action of that chemistry that goes on in, in a weapons lab where you have to you know work with things like plutonium and uh, related things made uh, in nuclear reactors. Um, anyway, Glenn Seaborg. Um, uh, was in, involved in the Manhattan Project and uh, was the real chemist in that project. Um, and chemistry has been maintained at Los Alamos National Lab as, as a, a discipline that's really essential to maintaining the stockpile and uh, improving processes that that are used for maintenance of, of nuclear weapons. And, uh, and then they're an energy lab as well, so they're 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 the national they call themselves a national security laboratory. So all things related to national security, not only having nuclear weapons, but uh, having you know energy sources that are uh, protected and uh, having independence in energy and so forth are all national security issues. So a lot of the things that my group is working on were of interest to the people, the scientists, the chemists, especially at, at the, the weapons lab. So I I was ready for a sabbatical again. Uh, I forgot exactly when it was. I, was it 2004 or something? That's like right, that. 2004. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I decided I would go for six months. And uh, so the scientists there, the people who were in the management of the chemistry uh, uh, directorate, as they call it, um, they were they were interested in having me there, and they said we have this money from from uh, the Seaboard Fund, and we would like to support you. So they just paid my way, and I, I went over there and worked in an office, uh, talked to the scientists all the time, and worked on some papers of my own. And uh, it was a real sabbatical one. When I was in sort of familiar territory. The sad thing about it was that after I'd been there about a month, <clears throat> this was at a time when uh, safety was of even greater uh, uh, importance to the national labs uh, than, it is, than it normally was. There, there were a couple of accidents that happened in the chemistry division. And... Uh, the, the director of the laboratory uh, was a retired admiral in the Navy, and he was he was very uh, determined to, to make sure that safe, safety was was recognized as being really important. So he did the, the amazing thing of shutting down the entire laboratory and making all of the scientists and technicians think about safety and write protocols for how to make, make the lab safer so no more of these accidents would occur. And I was already on the site. I had an office. I was an employee. I was not an employee of Los Alamos, but having this appointment, I had to sit and watch all the videos that these so-called all-hands meetings that the director would call occasionally and he would 
express his anger with the division of chemistry and others that had had accidents, security accidents. And um, I think in the end that, uh, I, mean, I know that the chemists were really unhappy uh, with that situation. Uh, the, I think they, the accidents were, were not insignificant. You know, a laser accident with an undergraduate occurred at that time. Um, and, and they made some mistakes in the lab so that it, its importance was magnified. But they also had security problems where they thought they'd lost some, some disk that had classified information on them. It turns out the disk never really existed. Uh, and it was just a cat the cataloging incorrectly somehow led to the thinking that it was missing. But everything quieted down eventually. But some of the people that are, were good friends of mine, including the leader of the chemistry division, was expelled from the lab during that period. And uh, when the lab was shut down, his security uh, clearance, his, his, his card, his, his admittance card to the lab was had to be returned. And so he had to just sit around at home during this time. So I had to try to play sort of a job counselor in a way because everybody was thinking, this really stinks. I'm going to go somewhere else. And so we would talk about things and I would try to get them toned down a little bit. So I was sort of a, a counselor that people came and sat and talked to regularly. Uh, so it was, it was not as... Uh, enjoyable as I had hoped. Um, plus, I had some experiments that we were going to do using a special reactor that they had at Los Alamos that was built to be explosion proof so that if something went off uh, inside of it, it would be contained completely. Um, <clears throat> and we were thinking about heating methane and oxygen in the presence of our catalyst to high temperatures to see how much conversion we could get under conditions of high concentration of both of those reagents. Um, and it was going to be carried out in that reactor, which was remotely controlled and so forth. And of course, when the lab was shut down, nobody could do any experiments. And it was shut down for, for a long time. You don't sort of casually shut down a, a nuclear facility because there's so many procedures that have to be implemented when you start it up again. It takes months and months, if not years, to get everything back up fully running again, which is probably one of the reasons that that director of the laboratory was moved to a desk in Washington and a new director of the lab was put in place. So there were other reasons too. Uh, it was also part of the reason why uh, the University of California, which used to be the sole contractor for Los Alamos, uh, just like Caltech is for JPL, uh, that they, the Congress got involved and they decided they needed to have a competition for who would be the co contractor. And so they, they ended up uh, adding some commercial, some industrial support, supporting management as well as Berkeley. Berkeley ended up still getting at least half of that contract, but some industries split the other part of it. So there was a whole reorganization that came about starting at the time I was there. And uh, so it it never does continue to be exactly like it was, but this was a very major disruption in the management and the style at Los Alamos. And I happened to be there right as it was taking place. So I returned to Caltech and went back to my labs. John, last question for today, a technical question. One of your most significant research areas during this time, mechanistic studies of the ethylene trimerization reaction with chromium. Tell me a little bit about that research. Yeah, this is what, this is what I was telling you about. Uh, actually, it started out with a, a report right at the time when we were getting this methane consortium uh, conversion consortium in place that BP reported this discovery that chromium catalyzed ethylene uh, could give one hexene in high yield. And they were very interested in that because it was so selective, maybe this would have some commercial interest. So I, 
I started consulting with them and they uh, on that project too, in addition to the consortium we were just establishing. And they gave us some funding uh, to do our sort of mechanistic studies of their process. And uh, again, Jay Levinger and I uh, were working with, with students, mainly with this uh, fellow that is now a, a professor at Caltech, Teo Agapi. And he was, uh, he was uh, doing the fundamental work on how their catalysts might work, identifying what the pre-catalyst is and so forth. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we did a lot of mechanistic studies that supported the mechanism that, that uh, one of the two mechanisms that we had there that we were thinking about. And um, anyway, we, we worked on that area for quite a while. And, and that was a good half of Teo Agape's PhD thesis with me. We also had uh, stocks working on it. Uh, it became a very interesting problem. Um, and in the end, we, we were trying to figure out what the true catalyst was. And we uh, did some very careful studies where we showed that when you, when you add the co-catalyst to the chromium complex, that's the pre-catalyst, um, there are a series of reactions that occur. There are beautiful color changes. It goes from dark blue to red to green and then to a pale blue color as it warms up to room temperature. And um, nobody really knew at the time what which one of those species, the, the blue one, they're putting the blue one because that's what we started with. But when you added a cup catalyst, it immediately went red. Is that the true catalyst or does it have to go to the green thing? Or Anyway, we're doing not only the visible studies of this, it was very clean conversions, but we were doing uh, what's called electron paramagnetic resonance studies, EPR studies. <clears throat> and uh, we came to a, a, ultimately, we came to the conclusion that the chromium system was very complicated. And we could, sh we could say with confidence that neither the blue nor the red nor the green nor the final pale blue species was the catalyst. <laughs> It was there in only a few percent, uh, and it was not visible by any of those spectroscopic methods we were employing. Um, in other words, uh, the catalyst activity started at low temperature and was maintained all through all of those color changes and uh, EPR changes that we saw. Uh, and uh, so the, the conclusion is that if you see the catalyst, um, there was always the thinking in the catalytic community that if you see the compound, compound by some technique, it's probably not the catalyst because the catalyst is so active, it's probably a very minor component of the whole thing. Um, and that was certainly true in our system. Um, and so we, we, were, we were totally frustrated at that point with, with, the, uh, with the chromium system and we decided to follow up on a study that was done in Japan at the chemical company called Mitsui. Um, and we, we, we studied a titanium catalyst, so we're back in titanium world again, like all of the polymerization. But I'm sure the Mitsui people found by accident that a certain ligand system around titanium gave only one hexane and not polyethylene out of, out of ethylene. So that was hexane's a lot more valuable than polyethylene. So making this thing very selectively <clears throat> was a good idea. And in fact, it makes a little bit of polymer depending on how good the specific titanium catalyst is. Uh, and you don't want that. So you, you want to minimize the polyethylene, maximize the one hexane that you get. And we were studying that catalyst in great detail and we made some real progress in that area. <clears throat> we found that you could support it, and if you supported it, it gave much higher activity, uh, made much less polyethylene. And uh, so the chromium catalyst led to a titanium catalyst where we could follow in an NMR tube the catalyst itself. We could actually see the precatalyst, and we could see what, what things were formed from the precatalyst. And 
and follow the reaction in an hour two, which was very nice. John, that's a great place to pick up for next time where we'll talk about your work with the DOE on catalysis. Mm -hmm.